Welcome to the Destiny Church Tees Valley podcast. As you listen, it is our prayer that you were transformed through faith, hope, and love. So good to see you, and I hope that, uh, that you're feeling relaxed and ready to hear what God wants to say to you. Um, last week, we talked about Uh, patterns. Faith just introduced the whole aspect of the importance of patterns in our life. We have so many different patterns, don't we, in every area. And as I got to think about it, I realized that actually that every area of our life has patterns in some aspect to it. And uh, and that really uh, means that it's an important subject. And I don't know about you, but uh, there's always a need to change some kind of pattern in, in our lives, aren't we? I, I know in my life there are areas that I need to change the pattern in my life. And, uh, and so after Sunday's message last week, I wrote down the areas to look at <clears throat> and uh, that I needed to spend time thinking about, praying about, and just really to try to make some alterations. So, so this week is um, kind of coming off the back of that. And what I thought what would be important is to kind of, how can we at least get um, the process going of change, to change the pattern in our life. And for all of us, it will be different areas that we want to change. Um, Some aspect, we get into a rut in different areas. We just get used to the the mundane, the the doing it the same way, and we can often get frustrated with that. Maybe uh, it could be a, a routine in your day. Um, It could be just something that's part of your weekly routine. It might be to do with an aspect of the way that uh, things are in your marriage or in your family or in your workplace or just in your uh, thinking, whatever it might be. Uh, So today I want to talk about that. I want us to kind of look at how can we really um, get off the the starting block, as it were, and, uh, and start to make the change, to run the new race that we want to run because it's so easy to become apathetic and, and, and lethargic, isn't it? In so many areas, we get used to things. And so today, I just think it's important that we actually look at that and to see how we can um, to make those kind of uh, changes. You see, successful people are people of action. They are not people who, um, who sit around. They are not people who um, need someone to motivate them. They are on the go. They are always busy, well, whatever it, it might be. Now, <clears throat> um, that is, I think, a key for all of us. I don't know about you, but I want you to be successful. And the reason for that is God wants you to be successful. He says he wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to be profitable. He wants you to to live a life that's significant, that isn't just um, going through the motions. He has called us, he created us for a purpose. He's got an assignment for every single one of us, and so we need to be a people of action. And I don't know about you, but the people that are, I admire are the people that are go-getters. There are people that actually, when I look at them, they, they, are, they have achieved things, and they have achieved things not because they were put, um, uh, uh, you know, easy for them to achieve, but because they had to work hard at them. They had to be disciplined. They had to go through maybe many, much pain, many problems, many difficulties in order to be able to achieve the things that they have achieved. And so... That's what God wants us to do. If you look at the Bible, the people that achieved things in the Bible were men and women of action. Yes, if it was Daniel, he was a a man of action. If it was David, if it was Paul, if it was Nehemiah, uh, we're going through a series in Nehemiah for our uh, small group leaders, and and, and he was a man of action. He he wasn't uh, just waiting for things to happen And we know that Jesus was a man of action. He was always uh, about going about doing things, wasn't he? You know, uh, one of the scriptures says that uh, that there wouldn't be enough room in all the books in the world to really to to tell of the things that Jesus did. And so um, it's important that we actually um, 
try to emulate that in some way. Yes, try to make our life different. Now, we can't maybe go from um, being, um, you know, on the couch to 5K overnight. But if we engage in the process, if we get started, there's a good chance, there's certainly a better chance than if we just stay on the couch. Yes? And so it's important that we actually do that. So I believe we need to learn to be self-starters. Very few people in life are self-starters, but I believe we can learn to be self-starters in the various areas of our life. James chapter 2 and verse 17 says this, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So in other words, we can believe, but unless we accompany it by doing something, then our faith is dead. It, it's meaningless, isn't it? I've had people say to me um, that to maybe used to come to the church, I know some people and uh, or people that haven't come, they say, I believe, but they don't come to church, they're not in a small group, they're not, they're not witnessing, they're not active in any capacity, but they believe. Well, in this same book that we read that in, James says, well, the devil believes, the demons believe, but they're not going to have uh, life in eternity. They're not in a relationship with God. So in other words, it's a two-pronged thing. It needs to be something that we, that we have faith for and that we believe, but it has to be something that has action. It has to have legs on it. We have to do something about it. So we, in order to grow in our faith, in order to grow in business, in order to grow in your character, in order to grow in any area of your life, we have to be people of action, people who will do things about that. Amen? So the first thing we're going to look at is what motivates us to change. What actually motivates us to change? Well, the first thing that actually motivates us to change so often is pain. Yeah? Yeah? It's, it's so often the pain that, that, that is what gets us going and moving. In fact, I was watching um, a movie on Netflix uh, the other night. I'm trying to think what it was called now, because I know you'll all want to watch it, won't you? Um, I'll, I'll find the name of it, hopefully. But it was about um, a, a, a swimmer. And she was going to, um, uh, the, the whole thing is about her underwater, or under the ice, you know, you've got kind of ice like this. And, she, and it's about her obviously holding her breath and swimming uh, underwater and how far can she go? Because the, 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 uh, one man uh, had done 80 meters. That was the, the longest that had ever been swum underwater holding one's breath. And so she felt that as a woman, she could do what any man could do, yes? So she had the belief. But, uh, but what really triggered all this, because part of her, uh, her nature was she was a, an action girl in every aspect, was that she had an injury on her leg, and, uh, uh, which was a devastating thing. And it actually, it's gory, it does show you the injury. But, uh, but actually, one of the therapies that she understood about was cold water therapy, and, uh, and so she started going to icy water, and that was why. So it was just started by putting one leg in. Yes. The, 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 and then eventually she thought, oh, well, I might as well put the other leg in. And then, of course, it started, and that's how it, it, it grew. And I won't spoil the movie for you, <laughs> uh, if you if you look it up. Um, but the whole issue was, is it was pain that started her on the process. Yes. And for many of us, it is pain, isn't it, that caused that? When we read the story of the prodigal son, it was pain that caused him to change his ways. It was because he got desperate, because he lost everything, because he was now uh, just eating the swill from the farmers, kind of what he was feeding to the pigs. Uh, because things had gone to the lowest possible level for him, that pain caused him to, de to, to change, and he decided he was going to go home, and whatever the cost, even if it was going to cost him his life, and there was a high likelihood that it would cost him his life, um, because when we read that whole old story of the prodigal son, that when the father goes to greet his son, it says that he ran towards him. Now, the issue is in that culture 
of the day. It's an honor-shame culture. And so the issue was, if this son had come back um, and, and been accepted back, that the whole, the whole village that, that there was there would have, um, would have been against the son and they would have, we, they would have been to trying to kill him because they didn't want this to, to infest and to become a part of the culture. Um, and so when the father runs, the issue of running was is that a, a, a man in the ancient would never let his ankles show. It, was a, it, was a, a, it would have been a shame. And the only time he would let his ankles, in other words, the only time he would run was if there was danger. So he understood that his son was in danger. And because his son was in danger, he ran to him and he put his arms around him. That's key as well. I'm, I'm digressing here. I don't know why I'm digressing. But anyway, the whole thing was is that he digressed. I'm digressing. That he puts his arms around him for the simple reason it was, he was saying to the villagers and to every other father in the village, he was saying, if you're going to kill my son, you've got to get through me. So in other words, that's the picture of the father heart to us. But it's so often it's a pain, isn't it? And, uh, and we are often willing uh, to do that. So I know we often say when we see the light, we change. But actually, I often found that it's when we feel the heat that we actually are willing to make some change. Whether that pain is physical, whether that pain is emotional or psychological, whatever that might be, we do that. Now, one of the, the verses that I've memorized for a long time because of this is Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 13. You should have it in your notes. It says this. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. And that's so true, isn't it? That it takes something painful for us to change our ways. The second thing is pressure. Pressure is often the thing that motivates us to change. So it might be pressure from a boss and he's saying to you, unless you improve, unless you start doing this and that, you're going to get fired. It might be pressure from the doctor that says, unless you quit smoking, you're going to die. It might be pressure from a teacher saying, unless you get such and such a grade, you're going to fail. But the problem with both of these, whether it's pain or pressure, is the fact that when the pain or the pressure is eased, we often revert back to our usual way of doing it. In other words, we squat like mad for an exam, but when the exam's over... <laughs> We don't keep in the same study format, yeah? We lose some of those things. So in other words, some of the things that we do under pain and pressure, they might get us to change, but often they, they are a, uh, um, uh, what was the, what's the term? A, a, a limited. They are, they are short term. There's another word I'm looking for that won't come to us. But once that's done, we go back to our normal ways. We go back to, uh, to, to the status quo um, for that. So we've got, to, we've got to be willing to change. Now, we see this in Elijah in 1 Kings 17. He has, um, God uh, told him to go to the brook, and he says, the brook will supply you with water to drink. And so Elijah stayed by the Kirith brook, and after a while, he, um, the brook dried up. Then the Lord said to Elijah, now get up and go. <clears throat> So God had told him to go to this brook. So he was there. He had water to drink. In fact, he was waited on. He had kind of hotel service. The ravens would come and bring him his daily food. And everything seemed fine. And Elijah thought, this is, this is the way that it should be. But then, of course, God changed things. And the ravens stopped going. And the brook dried up. And God said, it's time to go. <clears throat> So in other words, it's so often it is the pressure, isn't it? It's the problem that causes, and it's the same with the guys in the Bible, and we are no different from that. It's the brook has dried up. Let me ask you a question. What has dried up in your life? Is there something that's dried up in your life that, that is God trying to tell you it's time to move? It's time to get going. It's time to make a change. Sometimes it's finances that, that causes us to make a change. It could be any, uh, any number of things that, that God uses <clears throat> to make a change. But the third reason, which is the most powerful reason, and is the reason that will sustain you in the long haul, is perspective. If you can get a change in perspective, so it's not just pain, it's not just pressure, but actually that you have got a new perspective, then that will change you. 
And we see this in Paul on the Damascus Road. When, he's, when he has an encounter with God, it changes him for the rest of his life because he saw things differently. Yes? Acts 9, 3 to 6 says, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice. Who are you, Lord? Paul asked. I am Jesus. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. So often it's the need to have a, 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 like a eureka moment, a, a moment where we get a new, fresh perspective. And that's, that what, that's what every one of us need, and you can get that. And God wants to give you that, and he'll give you that as you seek him and spend time with him. So let's quickly look at some of the steps that we can take to create a new pattern, to create the new venture, to get, get some momentum, to get moving in our lives there are, let, let's kind of look at that. And so the first thing is, is we need to um, accept uh, or assume responsibility for our own life. Yes, rather than uh, for, uh, expecting other people to, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to assume responsibility. That's what, that's what children often do. But as we grow up, we need to be mature and be willing to take and accept responsibility for our life. In other words, you are where you are because of your, uh, of your actions or inactions uh, in life. And I found that there are three types of people. There are those who are uh, accusers. And uh, these are the kind of people who their favorite phrase is, it's their fault, it's your fault. It's always somebody else's fault for the reason that they're in the situation that they are in. Yes, they're always busy accusing someone else. And I don't know if you've ever come across such people, but they're always kind of mourning about somebody else. It's somebody else's fault, and it's so easy to do that. Now, just in case you're thinking it's a modern phenomenon, I want you to know that it's actually happened right from the beginning by a guy called Adam. Yeah, like a good man, he said, it's my wife. <laughs> She's to blame, yes. And ever since those guys, we're blaming our wives, okay? So if you're blaming your wife, you're in good company. Uh, but that doesn't make it right, of course. Then there are excuses. They've got an excuse for everything. doesn't matter what it is. They come up with some brilliant excuses, yes? Um, they rationalize things. In other words, they make rational lies <laughs> of things, yes? And, uh, and, and so we try to kind of make an excuse. Your brain will always come up with an excuse for why you can't do something, yes? And, um, and if I had an excuse for every time somebody says, why they can't come to church, I would be a rich man, yes? Um, because uh, we've always got some excuses. Now, some obviously are genuine reasons for that, and I'm not saying if the, the things, but what I'm saying is it's so easy, isn't it? and uh, uh, that we make excuses for that. <clears throat> and um, a guy called George Washington Carver said this, 99% of all failures come from people who developed a habit of making excuses. So the fact is that accusers and excusers are losers. You could tweet that. There you go. But there is a third kind of person, and this is the kind of person that I want all of us to be, and that is choosers. We want to be people who choose to do the right thing, choose to change, choose to get moving, choose to be people of action in our life. Amen? In other words, we're ac accepting responsibility for our actions, for our life, for where we are. In other words, when we make a mistake, we admit it, we own it, we uh, own up about it. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says this, <clears throat> A man who refuses to... So it obviously doesn't apply to women. Okay, it's generic. Men, as it were. Mankind. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, then he gets another chance. That's the first thing we've got to do is we've just got to accept responsibility. I blew it. I made a mistake. I did wrong. I didn't do what I should have done. And when we do that, we're really setting ourselves up to get moving and to see God working in our lives and helping us. So my question to you is, who are you blaming for where you are or for what's happening 
in your life. Secondly, we need to believe that we can change. We've got to believe it that we can. So we've got to stop saying, I can't change. Yes, we've got to start saying, yes, I can change. Our attitude will determine our ability. If you think you can't do it, then you're not going to try to do it. But if you believe you can do it, then, of course, you're going to put everything in action to be able uh, to do it. It's going to take a reprogramming of the mind, which, uh, which what we faith mentioned last week in Romans 12, verse 2. Let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of mind. So success starts in our mind. It starts with the decisions that we make. Yes? And so it's how you see yourself. Moses, when God said to him, I want you to, to lead my people... Uh, when he called him to ministry, he said to them, what did Moses say? He said, you've got the wrong guy. Who am I? I can't do it. I'm inadequate. I can't speak well. And, and he made his excuses. And then Gideon, what about Gideon? When Gideon was called and he said, I want you to defeat the enemy. I want you to be a leader. What he said, oh, who am I? That can't be right, Lord, because I'm the smallest guy, the most inferior in my tribe, in my family, in the, you know, it can't be me. And then, of course, Jeremiah, he just said, I'm a teenager. Which, of course, covered all the bases, yes. So, in other words, we've always got some excuse, haven't we, that when God calls us to ministry, I've seen it so many times, and I want to say to you, I've said it myself. Only every Sunday morning, just prior to getting up on a Sunday to preach, I go, Lord, you've got the wrong guy. And it's so easy, isn't it? Because we're always trying to make excuses or pass the book or we often feel inferior. But actually, if we will just get up and go, it's amazing what God does. Amen? So we've got to build our faith first. And that's what God did with these guys. He just built their faith and he said, I believe in you. I'll be with you and I'll help you. Mark 9, 23 says, everything is possible to him or her who believes. So let me ask you a question. What would you like to change in your life? What would you like to change in your life? So whatever it is, you first you've got to accept responsibility for the change. And secondly, you've got to believe that it can be changed. And thirdly, we've got to clarify what you really want. What is it that you want uh, to see change? You've got to make, bring some clarity to it. In other words, you've got to start writing it down putting it in writing, putting it somewhere where you can see it. Start to kind of uh, make, make some goals to it. Say, right, this is where I want to be. What are some small steps to get there? Uh, you know, I want to be able to swim underwater for, for, for 80 meters. How, how am I going to do that? Whatever it might be, it might be your marriage. It could be your kids. It could be your workplace. Whatever it might be that you want to see change, it might be your involvement in church and getting involved in a ministry, whatever it could be, write it down, clarify what it is. Psychologists have said over and over <clears throat> that the most helpful thing that they can do for people is to help them establish goals. By helping people establish goals, they're giving them hope. They're giving them a plan for their future. You see, what I found is very few people have written goals. Very few people have goals of what they're really believing for. If you ask them, they might take something out of their head. But very, and I want to say to you, the top achievers in any endeavor are the people who have written down their goals, who have got clearly defined goals to get where they want to go. And so we need to do that. The problem so often is, is we can't make up our mind. So we're uncertain and we're undecided and we think to ourselves, I really want to change, but, but, but they're not willing to commit to it. So, uh, you know, we want to see a change in a marriage, but not willing to make a commitment to it and do what's necessary. I want to make, see a change in, uh, in the way I study, but, but there's no clarification in goals of what you're going to do, whatever area it might be. You need to clarify that, yes? Or you could do what I do and say, Lord, just change them. Unfortunately, the only person who changes when I pray that prayer is, is me, isn't he? That's the one he wants to change, and so he wants to change us. And James says this, a double-minded man is, in, is unstable in one or two ways. What does it say? 
in all of his... And that's that is profound, isn't it? This is what God says, is that if you are indecisive, you're indecisive in every area of your life, and every area of your life is going to be affected by your indecision. And so when you start to become decisive, it can transform your life just by making decisions, by, by making a difference. And so we've got to change from saying, the time isn't right, and I'm not ready, or the circumstances are not right. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 4 talks about this. And it says, if you wait until the wind and the weather are just right, you will never plant anything and never harvest anything. In other words, if you look to the wind, you're not going to start sowing the seeds because you're scared it's going to get blown away. And if it comes to harvest time, you say, well, I'm not going to go harvest because it looks like it's going to rain. In other words, if you're waiting for perfect situation and circumstances, it's never going to happen. You've got to act now. You've got to start to make some progress even when things are not right. We have got to stop trying to... Uh, to again, it's an excuse, isn't it? And it causes us uh, to, to procrastinate. Amen? And procrastination often is a result of us wanting perfect circumstances in our life. It paralyzes our potential when we're looking to have every, all the ducks lined up, as it were, to get everything right uh, before, uh, before we, we do that. So we've got to do that. If we want to change a negative pattern in our life, we have got to assume responsibility for it. We have got to believe that we can change. We've got to clarify the situation We've not got to wait for the circumstances to be ideal. And next, we have got to exercise our body. We've got to do some physical exercise. Yes, I know you might be surprised at this one, but 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8 says, physical exercise has its value. Now, okay, it doesn't have as much value as spiritual exercise, but it does have value, yes? The reason is for most people are too tired to change. They're in fatigue, they're, they're not feeling uh, energetic. If you're not feeling energetic, it's hard to make the right decisions. When I'm tired, I eat the wrong things. Yes, when, I, when I'm tired, um, you know, I, 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 you think to yourself, oh, I'll put it off, I'll put it off. And, uh, and we're all the same. Because fatigue is a major cause of procrastination. So we've got to get some energy. And in order to get some energy, you've got to expend some energy. It's kind of a circular thing, isn't it? So if you want to be able to have more energy, you've got to expend more energy. You've got to get to the gym or get walking down the block or whatever it might be. You've got to start to, to get some exercise in. Yes, start getting them weights going or whatever it might be, you know, so that, so that you're kind of getting into shape because when you're in shape, it transforms the way you think because you're thinking sharper you're, and you're, you're better than that. That's why we have the Luke 2.52 and it's so encouraging uh, to, to see some of those and some of the people and the things that they do and you kind of think, oh, that's exciting, that's encouraging and it encourages you what they're doing, yes? And, uh, and you're seeing that, that and that's getting part of the community. Join the Luke 2.52 and get a part. You know, we go for walks together and do various things. Now, it's not the answer to everything. You've got to set your own goals. You've got to assume the responsibility for your own life. You've got to believe that it can be done. You've got to clarify what needs to be done in your life, but then you've got to exercise. You've got to give yourself the energy. Amen? Because our bodies are made for movement. They are not meant to be static. You see, the ultimate, in when you are totally static, you know what that's called? Dead. <laughs> There's no movement then, is there? Like, you know, you've, you've done that. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've noticed, but if ever you go to the hospital for surgery or anything... They're always this kind of, they slice and dice here, and then they're, they, they want you off the table, don't they? Yes. So in other words, if you go to see Dr. Reese, and, uh, and he's, uh, he's operating on you, and I pray he doesn't have to do I keep praying every day, Lord. And that's why I try to keep him sweet, um, if ever I am on there. But, he's, but, he's, but what, what's the key? The key is, is straight away they want them up and about as much as they can. I've, uh, the, the times I've seen people have had uh, new hips and they've had new knees and whatever. And within, within, you know, it seems like moments they've got them up and they're walking and you think to yourself, no, 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 if that was me, I would need six months 
just been waited on hand and foot. You know, just, I mean, that's me looking in somebody else. Never mind if I'd gone through that. So doctors understand this, that we are created for movement, and it helps the healing process uh, when they do that. And if you want to know more about that, uh, Dr. Reese will, I'm sure, uh, be able to... Um, uh, to, to uh, furnish you with that. Because inactivity kills. So we've got to start to get active, haven't we? Yes? But now, there's also, obviously, spiritual reasons to get to, get to be healthy and, and to be exercising. And that is because God created our body. It belongs to him. It honors God when we actually look after our body. And Jesus died for our body. Yes? And so, uh, so it means something to us. The Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, indwells in your body. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you. So that's good reasons, isn't it, to, to, to look after our body. So if you're de- depressed, the key is exercise. Go for a walk, because that's one of the biggest things that will help you and just uh, give you a, a bit of that. Now, of course, if you've got teenagers, mothers, there's a great verse that you can quote here. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 34, it says, Get up and make your bed. (laughs) And the last thing we need to do after we've assumed assumed responsibility and believe that we can be done and that we've clarified what needs to be done and we're not waiting for uh, for all the the, the ducks to line up, as it were, uh, and we're, we're, we're getting some energy and exercising, the last thing that we need to do is we need to fire away. The only thing I could think of beginning with F. Um, I, like, I like the Nike thing. Just do it. Yes. In other words, uh, get into action. Do it now. Fire away. Do it now. Because people are always saying, one of these days, tomorrow I'll do it. Next week I'll do it. You know, when, when, I've, when, I've, when my exams are finished, then I'll do it. When this is done, then I'll do it. There's always reasons for, what, for not doing it. Proverbs 27 and verse 1 says this, Never boast about tomorrow. You don't know what will happen between now and then. We cannot presume uh, uh, that we're going to have a tomorrow. I cannot even presume that I'm going to have another hour. You know, we can't, we can't because our lives are in God's hands and God knows the end. He knows the finish line. He knows uh, he's got it all in. He's, he's planned it in his diary. It's all part of the process and it's mind-blowing. So, you know, like for, for us guys, when we watch match of the day and we already know what the result of the match is between Chelsea and Liverpool, say, for example... Sorry, uh, uh, Bernard. But, but when we know what the result is, yes, we can watch that knowing the result and it's like we already know and that's what God's doing with your life and my life. He knows what the finish is. We don't, but we mustn't start to boast about the future and what we will be and will become. We need to make sure that we understand that everything is in God's plan. Faith without action is worthless. It requires us to do something about what we believe. Do you believe your body belongs to God? Do you believe the things that God has called you to do? Do you believe about the ministry that God has placed in your heart? That prophetic word that's maybe been spoken over your life and you've not seen it come to pass. What do you need to do in some small steps to start seeing that coming into process? I believe we need to analyze ourselves over these six points and say, where do I need to work? What area do I need to work on in these few areas? Because God is asking each one of us. You know the areas, you know the areas in your life and they're different probably for every one of us. Probably as many people as are in here, there's something completely different for us. Areas in your life and you're saying, Lord, I just wish I could have some change. Well, today, you can learn a new pattern. You can get into a new rhythm. You can have a new way of doing things. You can get out of the rut that you're in and get into maybe into a rut that you want to get in. Yes, get into a groove. And it all starts by doing this. Amen? And so I believe that that's something that that, that we need to do. Now, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've just thought about it and you maybe today might be your first time, but it might be that you've been here for, for weeks or months or even years and you keep saying, oh, you know, I, I will do, I might do. Uh, one of these days I will give my life to Jesus. I want to say to you today is the day of salvation. 
And today is the day to make that decision. And today you can do that. You can assume responsibility for your future, your eternal future today. And I, and I hope that you'll do that. If you want to do that today, and you say, I want to say yes to you, there's a, um, a Connect card in front, and we'd love for you just to tick the box on that, that you're committing your life to Jesus. But one of the things that often uh, is required in making a commitment is to make a public commitment about them. You know, do something, uh, some action about it. So what I want you to do is, if you want to give your life to Jesus today, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want you just to, to pray it along with me. Uh, but what I want you to do is to tell someone about the decision that you've made, yes? The, the, because if you'll do that, I want to say to you, the Bible says that that's when it, it goes concrete into your mind. When you believe uh, with your heart and you confess with your mouth, then you are saved. That's what it requires, the two things. It needs you to do something, yes, uh, to, to confess uh, with your mouth, to actually to say something about what God has done in your life and God will do that. Maybe you would like to do that today. And if you would, Len, I just want to give that opportunity. So if we could all just bow our heads for a moment and uh, uh, just want to, uh, to pray. Father, I thank you today. And just one might want to repeat these words in your mind uh, or outwardly, whatever uh, you're comfortable with. Heavenly Father, I thank you that for today that you brought me here. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, to, to die in my place. I thank you that, uh, that, that you have a plan and a purpose for my life. And today, Lord, I recognize that I need to, to assume responsibility for my life. And so today, Lord, I want to make that decision to follow you. I want, to, to, uh, well, I want my life to have meaning. I want my life to have significance. I want my life to be different, to be changed, to be new. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come into my life and fill me afresh and fill me new. I thank you that today, Lord, that you wash all the wrong things away in my life, the times when I've blown it, when the times that I've done silly things. I thank you, Lord, that today you say that you forgive me. And I thank you that today, Lord, you're going to give me a new power to live in, that every day I can come to you and that you can, Lord, that you will give me the energy Lord, to live for you, that you'll help me to make the right decisions. And I thank you, Lord, that you have a destiny for me, that you're making a home in heaven for me, that I am now part of your family. Help me, to, Lord, to see and realize all that this, uh, that this uh, encompasses, that, Lord, that I would truly reach my full potential in Christ today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Maybe today you are here and you've made that decision to follow Christ but you know there's some area that God is wanting you to change in. I want you to write that down on your communication card. Will you be bold? And if you're able to do that, it might be something too personal and you don't feel comfortable to do that. But we're just going to uh, pass the bucket round as we sing this final song. And it would be so good because, again, it's making that outward commitment. Um, you're making a demonstration of that. In a, if you're in Connect Group then again, you can, you can do any connect group. Share what it is that God's wanting uh, to do in your life. What is the change that God is wanting to make in your life that you've, you've, been, uh, you, you've been procrastinating about or you've got into a, a, a rut about, you've got into just a negative pattern in your life and today wants you to, God wants you to be in a new pattern, a pattern that follows Christ, a pattern that will make every difference in him. Will you do that? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening today. If this message spoke to you and you would like prayer, or perhaps this is your first time listening, then we'd love to connect with you at www.thedestinychurch.co.uk forward slash connect. You're welcome to join us every Sunday in person or online at 11am.